Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the work we've been doing um, over in our lab. And basically, we come at it from a sort of nursing perspective. So we're very much used to the, the human computer interface side of things. So um, really looking at, you know, how, what the user's experience of this is and, and how um, we, these sort of technologies can sort of improve healthcare um, and for people with a variety of conditions. Um, it's a very topical issue, hence the, uh, the Ready Player One. How many of you have seen it? Yeah, oh, there's a fair few here uh, at the moment, as we know, and, and there's quite a bit of hype. But this slide deck, actually, I use this with a lot of other people, so forgive me, some of the early ones probably, because um, I'm speaking to a techie audience here, so some of them might go over. But if we think about it, VR's been around. There's this desire for immersion and presence has been around for a long time. We think of it as a new phenomena. I mean, if you look at the uh, panoramic pictures uh, that originally artists trying to get this sense of what it's like to be immersed and present in a setting. Uh, and then, of course, those of you who remember these, yeah, stereoscopes, things like that. We all probably played around with those as a kid. Um, in the Really, go back to 1838. It surprised me how long ago. And then, of course, um, you pro I'm not sure if I'm going to get this to work, but uh, we can try. Um, yeah, the, uh, the very famous very first moving picture, a train arrives in a station which apparently had people running out, I think it's an urban myth, screaming because they were so scared of the train arriving as, as it came in. But uh, we've also had early head mounted displays since the 1950s as well. So I guess what I'm getting to is why is this sort of interest uh, in VR and particularly in clinical research sort of taking off now? And it's not just the technology, the technology has been around for quite a while. Um, since the 80s, but of course it's become affordable now and there's now commercial products. But if we actually look at sort of what's happening in clinical research in the use of in healthcare, um, VR is actually expanding quite hugely. Uh, and we're beginning to see this sort of exponential curve. As an example, that's uh, PubMed 2018, and that's a number of publications of VR virtual reality clinical application papers since 1985. And you can see that's beginning to look pretty... Uh, exponential. Um, and interestingly enough, this year, I looked at this year, there were 482 in 2018 already. I love PubMed. You can just go and plow this stuff straight off it. It's, it's great, rather than having to go in-depth searches. So, uh, you know, we have got a technology that is now being used in a wide variety of clinical contexts. So I'm just going to talk about some of those and the ones we've been working with. Now, probably, what's, what's the first one that springs to mind if we think of healthcare to your mind, what, using VR in healthcare, what's your first sense of where it's been used? Surgery. Surgery, a little bit for education and surgery and development. Yeah, I'm thinking more of actual patient uh, use of it. Distracting them? Yeah, pain and, and distraction is, is probably the major area where most of the papers are being written. Um, so that's where we started off, um, and that's where I originally got interested in this, uh, as I say, back in sort of 2013 when I was reading stuff by Hunter Hoffman down in Seattle um, in his pain um, lab there using VR with Burns patients for acute uh, Burns dressing changes using VR as a powerful distractive therapy. And pain's a huge area because it's something um, that has a large uh, neurological and psychological component as well and it's a significant health issue that we don't really deal well with in our in our health system brilliantly um, I mean if, if we look at sort of the statistics one in five can Canadians are suffering with persistent pain. This is the Canadian Pain Society. Uh, only 30% of ordered medication is given. 50% experience moderate severe pain after surgery. These are sort of interesting statistics that show it's, it's still quite a sort of relevant issue in Canadian society and elsewhere. Um, so VR environments have been sort of played around with in pain quite a bit. Um, and they're hypothesized, hypothesized to reduce pain via non-pharmacological attenuation and distractive mechanisms. So really what that means is we're not 100% sure how it works, but they, they do actually sort of have quite a significant effect in a lot of people, mainly because we still don't fully, really well understand pain. I mean, I, I, I use these slides very generally to talk about pain. Um, we've got quite, quite complex pathways, neurological pathways, and uh, what we've got is uh, dual ascending pathways neurologically that transmit pain to the brain through the spinal cord. Um, and then we've also got um, descending pathways, which 
from the brain actually mediate and suppress pain. So we've got some pathways neurologically we know that are sending and facilitating pain, so increasing the experience of pain, and we've got other mechanisms that still we don't understand very well uh, that involve multiple areas of the brain that can suppress pain. Um, and I was talking to a colleague recently who was doing work on pain in endometriosis in women, a very painful condition, um, and uh, chronic pain condition, and uh, was, was giving some really interesting examples of the, the people who often with the worst uh, pathology that they see um, with endometriosis often aren't the ones who have the worst pain. Sometimes it's the patients who don't have really bad pathology when they do the investigations, but they're the ones who, who are having the worst pain. So we, we do know it's, it's very much um, psychologically mediated. So this is where VR can come in because it can be a non-pharmaceutical method, pharmacological method of, of controlling that. So in 2013, we did a review just to see, well, what's the state of the art? What's out there? What are people doing? A lot of it was in burns pain, um, quite acute pain. There wasn't anything in chronic pain, actually, at that time. I think there was one paper we found, a bit of research. But it was all being used for acute pain settings um, on the management of pain, uh, which we published. There was 17 studies that were there. Um, and five randomized control trials, six randomized crossover studies, two case series studies, and four single patient studies. But overall, only 337 patients have been you know, exposed to VR in these studies and been <coughs> documented. And only four of them had a low risk of bias. <laughs> so they, they were really, you know, really early studies, small groups, um, and very varied. Some of them were describing VR in simply using... Um, video games in a monitor headset which were two-dimensional others were using three-dimensional stereoscopic headsets with stereoscopic audio so very you know people were using the terminology different as well but overall the, it was interesting to note there, there wasn't good overall general evidence that in acute pain um, these technologies can actually influence people's experience and with uh, immediate and short-term pain reduction and moderate evidence was found of short-term effects on physical function as well, which was interesting. So there's some evidence that you can improve people's functionality, in other words, their movement, where they're restricted by pain by using VR, because if they see themselves moving in a VR environment, that actually persists afterwards, which is really interesting, and I'll come back to that point in a minute. Um, however, most of the evidence showed these acute pain treatments of using VR during acute pain, such as when you're doing a burns dressing pain uh, burns dressing uh, on a patient, and which are very painful procedures, or needle sticks on children, you know, painful things kids don't want to do. Using VR actually was a very powerful distractive mechanism, more powerful than other techniques that they were using. So what about adverse events? This is the question. Does these new technologies have any adverse events? Now, there's a lot of hype about VR and how wonderful it is. They don't tend to mention the fact that you know, cyber sickness, motion sickness is quite a significant problem for a lot of people, especially with the early designs. And the manufacturers now are very much spending a lot of time trying to design things that do not promote uh, cyber sickness. But still, a lot of the applications people find quite serious. Uh, I have my, my wife tried one of these and had to lie down for three hours afterwards, actually, after a 10-minute VR experience because she felt so sick. Uh, so literally, it, it can persist quite significantly. And, and we've, we've had other patients who've had similar effects as well. So it, it's not a sort of minor thing. Some people, most people don't have major effects of it, but some people it can really affect them quite badly. And then, of course, we've got the issue of eye strain. Uh, you, you've, you've got this sensation that you're in a VR environment and you're wandering around doing stuff, but you're staring for 30 minutes at a screen that's literally a few centimetres in front of your nose. And so that, that, that's an issue as well. Most people only really tolerate VR headsets for 30 minutes without sort of, you know, getting a little bit sort of eye ache and eye strain. So, I mean, the hardcore gamers will go at it for longer, but it's still not comfortable for any longer periods. But the good news was, apart from these things, it wasn't associated with any serious adverse events. Um, and it's quite interesting, if we remember the DK2 Oculus Rift headsets a few years back, only a couple of years back. I mean, you came with a warning not to use them on kids, <laughs> you know, because basically they weren't approved for use with children because they were worried about adverse effects. But uh, generally now, they're, they're pretty safe to use. Um, so more recently, we've seen this ramping up of uh, interest in, in virtual reality in clinical studies, and there's been really, an, what I'd describe, an explosion of VR pain risk studies. I sort of follow it 
and see you know, numerous papers coming in every day that are being published in the area. So th there has been quite a lot of activity. Um, acute pain medical procedures, for example, exa just, these are just a few. There's, there's a lot more, but um, used you know, in acute medical uh, procedures using them for cystoscopy, dressing changes, episiotomy, even dental surgery, they're using them now. VR headsets, quite keen on, on exploring that. Uh, and there's also been a few chronic pain studies. There's eight in progress I know of at the moment, and one of ours, uh, which I'll talk about a little more. And then there's some other interesting studies now with functionality and improving mobility in rehabilitation, particularly areas where they've been most successful have been um, phantom limb pain. They've had really good success there, which is this pain, for those who don't know, people who have uh, a limb amputated um, still get neurological sensations, even though the limb isn't there afterwards. Um, it's a basically quite severe amount of pain they can get from a leg that like cramp or feeling like that. You all know what cramp feels like really bad. Imagine getting that from a leg you don't actually have. So it's a really powerful pain. Um, and so uh, that's quite difficult to get rid of. And so, but they have very good success with phantom limb uh, pain using VR. I'll show you an example of that in a second. Um, and spinal cord injury, again, um, uh, neurological pain um, resulting from that. And fibromyalgia, which is an interesting one because it's still a slightly controversial diagnosis, although it tends to be more accepted. That's a more of a generalized pain syndrome, um, chronic pain syndrome. And, and basically, it's now just sort of thought out to be um, as a centralized pain state rather than um, uh, peripheral pain issues causing it. So there's quite a, f a lot in pain. This is, I'll just see if I can get that running. Um, let's just see. Here we go. So this is an example of a phantom limb. Um, I have to bring that across, there we go. And you can see this person only has one leg, but they've got a VR headset on and they're pedaling a uh, canoe down a river. And there's goats, uh, mounting goats and things like that. Um, let's make it a bit larger so you can see. And so what they see is that they have two legs pedaling. And uh, in reality, they've only got one that they're using on a cycle. And uh, but uh, if they use this repeatedly with exercises and maneuver around, they actually found they've been able to reduce their pain in, in phantom um, limb pain quite effectively. So that's, that's one. There's a number of them around uh, now being used, but that's, quite, that's one of the most successful ones I've seen used in a few research studies. Um, so that's an example there of using VR in that instance. We've been using it in a chronic pain study. Um, it, we did a pilot study in 2015 where we recruited 10 patients on a minuscule budget, uh, and with, uh, this was with DK2 headsets, and we got them to use uh, VR therapy at home for 30 minutes every other day and record pre and, post, pre and post pain levels with established pain assessment tools. That's a numerical rating scale, which is you've probably seen it. It's the very simple one where, the, you know, what's your pain on a zero to 10 scale, zero being no pain, 10 being the worst pain you can imagine. Um, and also another tool, a weekly neuropathic pain rating scale um, for, for looking at types of more centralized neurological um, pain issues. So. The, the problem we have with this when we set it up is it's great to measure pre and post, but how do you measure pain during when they've got the headset on in the VR experience? Um, we looked at a number of ways of trying to do it, and it, every time we tried something um, like pop up menus, that it just takes people out of the experience. If you've got if you're getting away from the experience and you're you're enjoying a VR experience and a message box says, hey, how much pain have you got? It automatically sort of focuses you straight on it. So we couldn't really do it, and we're still struggling with that problem. Um, so we're now generally asking people to you know, say what their pain was like while they were in the experience, just re self-reporting. Um, we also found that in this study that um, people were very individualized in what sort of VR experiences help with pain. We talked about mindfulness earlier. Um, mindfulness is great and works very well for some people uh, with pain, particularly chronic pain, and helps them relax. But there are some patients we find who actually it works, it actually aggravates them and makes their pain work. They get frustrated. Um, they, they need to be engaged in doing something. So we found some uh, of the sort of participants in our study work very well with the mindfulness application we had. We have one, it's called the virtual meditative walk, which get, they walk through a nice forest and gradually, uh, as they sort of go deeper into it, mist appears, and the more relaxed they get, more mist appears. So 
that sort of thing. But um, a lot of people drove them crazy. They really didn't like that. And they found that it was making them get frustrated because they wanted something to happen and, and nothing much was happening. So we had another, and this was another uh, relaxing one. This one was called um, Qualia Wildflowers. We fly like an eagle and relax and meditate. Um, but for others, we, we used applications that are designed to cognitively stimulate them. And so broadly, we found these two groups of applications seem to work quite well for most people. So in this one, this is one uh, called Carpe Lucem, um, which is you have to actually, it's a three-dimensional puzzle in VR, and you have light beams. These are the light beams coming out of these uh, light generators. And you have to bounce them around using mirrors um, to position mirrors in three dimensions all over the place or color changing uh, sort of uh, units and things like that to get the light of the right color into a flower at the end and then the flower opens up. It's, it's really fiendishly cunning. It's like, it's like almost like three dimensional chess in some way to try and figure out how you can get this to work. And, and that was more effective for some other people. So we've, we were finding there was sort of mixed results, but about 60% of pa patients had put some short-term pain reduction pre and post. Nothing much post, though, going on more than sort of 20 minutes after they finished. Um, but whilst they were in the actual experience, they, they actually did have some very significant um, pain reduction, and some of them said they, they completely forgot about their pain. One man described it as he says, well, I've got pain in, he had really bad arthritis in uh, an elbow joint and a knee. He says, when I'm thinking about my elbow, I don't think about my knee. And then when I think about my knee, I don't think about my... So it's like the distraction away from that. But he said, when I was in this, it was like I, I forgot about both of them, which was, was very good. Um, and we did find one patient, again, who reported that after the experience, their mobility, they were quite surprised they were more mobile because they'd been um, moving around in this three-dimensional virtual world. And afterwards, they found that translated into, you know, they went to the kitchen and put the kettle on, and they found they, they did that really easily, which they used to have a real struggle to do that because of you know, pain with their arm movements and things. Um, but there wasn't any real evidence of any longer-term benefits, and we published that one um, last year, actually. So there's some good evidence from what we've done so far for the use of VR for um, clinical pain control. But the, the field, to be honest, is very immature. Um, we're still not entirely sure what mechanisms work at work here. And um, But what we have found is that, the, the, in our experiences, the ones that work best are the, the headsets and VR experiences where I have a wide field of view, stereoscopic headsets, so stereo rather than um, just 360 two-dimensional videos, and the ones that promote the most sense of presence. So this seems to be the key to it, the sense of presence, being somewhere else. Um, and that's, again, something interesting because it's not always differentiated in studies. People use the term immersion and presence in the same way, but presence is, is really that um, psychological state of being somewhere else and experiencing something different. Immersion is more, you know, the technology. It's you generally describing the, how the technology actually makes you, you know, how good's the field of vision, number of pixels, etc., to, to make it more immersive. Um, so it's theoretically immature, we feel, at the moment. Um, and we need better tools to assess how, you know, how do we assess presence and immersion. Um, um, also, different applications seem to be important, and a lot of the studies don't differentiate the medium from the media. So that was something else that really we need to work on. You know, what's it, is it VR? Is it being somewhere else in a present in another setting? Or is it the fact you're, you know, you're escaping from... Um, uh, a dungeon or whatever you're doing or relaxing mindfulness, you know, making the difference between those. Most of the studies don't do that very well. Um, but consideration of cyber sickness and eye, point, uh, eye strain is still important as well. Um, we also found, because we were using this in people's home, we, uh, which was <laughs> quite daunting when we first did it, you can imagine setting up computers with, the, you know, DK2 Oculus software hardware, and which wasn't, you know, the most stable at the time. Um, but so you do need users with a bit of technical competence and skills, people who are familiar with, you know, just using um, controllers for games and things like that is an issue. And a lot of older people who have chronic pain don't. Um, hardware, software failures and damage weren't too bad, but there were some. Uh, they're getting better with as the, the sort of technology becomes more robust. And then, of course, you, with chronic pain users, we've got a lot of unpredictability with them. Um, unplanned illness surgery or you know follow-up protocols that take them out of our study uh, and of course there's always a lot of dropout with pain studies you always get that so you have to build that in 
Um, so ongoing work, what are we doing now? We've, we've got a, a randomised controlled study going on with uh, Simon Fraser University as well, with their School of uh, Interactive Arts and Technology, Dr Diane Grimala there, where we're uh, putting cancer survivors with chronic pain through uh, two intervention types using VR in their own homes. Um, and what we're comparing is we've got four applications, two which are based on mindfulness, two which are cognitive engagement applications. Two we've custom developed, two we've actually purchased because they're readily available and met our needs. And we're doing those in a VR versus a simple laptop version to see if we're going to find any, any difference there. Also, we've got another study we're looking into doing with the um, Chronic Pain Network based over at Surrey um, to use VR to augment rehabilitation. And that, this is another interesting area that's just sort of taking off quite a bit now. So if we have a look at sort of some of the other applications where VR is being used. Um, rehabilitation seems to be quite a big area where it's got a lot of potential and there's some good research coming out. So physical injury recovery, stroke recovery, there's already a commercial application you can buy which combines a VR with a robotic uh, interface. You can see the arms there are uh, attached to two cables which help assist the motion and the person, when the person moves using the VR, the cables assist the motion retraining there um, that you can buy that now on, and so that's actually a, one of the early commercial products um, and of course one of the things in VR that I, going back to what I was saying at the very start is it's not just a media where you can immerse yourself in real world events the beauty of it is it's a media where you can control the environment completely so you can you know if you want to change the gravity you want to do any you know environmental modifications you can make that environment whatever you want to the user user's experience. So this, for rehab, this is quite useful because you can actually, one of the projects we're, we're looking to get off the ground involves also, um, I'll, I'll talk about behavioural modification in a sec, but also involves amplification of movement. For example, as people who are frightened of moving because it's painful move, the classic thing they tend to do is move, you know, if you ask them the physiotherapy exercise to move a, a ball from here to here, they're very slow and they're very tentative about doing it. If they look like they're doing it in VR, and it shows that they've actually only moved that far, but they've moved this far, you've amplified their movement, um, it has an effect neurologically, it seems to rewire their brain a bit, and they find actually their movement does improve over time. So that's with the stroke recovery, that's, that's one of the things they found there is uh, it, it does accelerate recovery um, when it's used in this sort of manner. Behavioural modification, as I'm saying, um, there's quite a lot of research on anxiety disorders, post-traumatic stress disorders, there's been quite a bit of you know, a gradual controlled exposure to threatening environments for people with PTSD, particularly military, um, and phobias as well. You might have seen that one, the spider, which starts off with people with spider phobias, they get a very friendly f spider that doesn't look too threatening, that wanders around, and gradually they can... Uh, titrate it to begin more realistic spiders eventually ending up with a giant tarantula crawling up their arm. Uh, <laughs> I didn't put the tarantula on there, just in case anybody's... <laughs> so, you, you know, but graduating people's exposure to that in a virtual safe environment has been very effective. But they've also used it for other phobias and uh, eating disorders as well. Uh, it's been an area where there's been research published showing that VR has got a helpful in behavioural modification. So I think that these two areas are probably going to be quite big growth areas, to my mind, in research uh, in the future. And even in autism, again, behavioural modification there. An um, example would be as a study um, that uh, was looking at... Um, for example, kids with autism, as you probably know, get very um, upset about going things that disrupt their routine, going somewhere new. So being able to you know, put someone in a new situation um, virtually in their own environment and expose them to that before they actually go there uh, can help uh, control their anxiety levels when they actually get to go there. So those, those are the sorts of things that are, are working at the moment. And of course... The other area that seems to be taking off is health promotion and exercise. There's an example of a unit, you can actually buy this as well, which is uh, um, uh, an exercise machine that basically you fly, so you put the VR headset on and you fly by moving your muscles around. Um, so uh, it, it's, it, it may be an area. In fact, I was, I was saying at the start, I, I read a tweet that somebody was claiming they'd lost 10 pounds playing Skyrim with VR <laughs> recently on Reddit. So, uh, I mean, I, why they wouldn't just go out and run or bike, but I mean, it may be a, a better motivator for people to do that. So that, I think that area might as well be 
um, quite a big area of growth in VR research. Um, and of course, I haven't touched on this, but this is a massive area, and of course that's what a lot of folks here are interested in, is you know, education, health professional education. We've done a little bit of work with AR, as I said, with mobile phones in a lab to tag equipment so that it shows videos when people scan the equipment with their smartphone. But also, you know, there's a huge area in simulation we could use VR for, and a lot of people are, are doing that as a surgery, as you mentioned earlier, and uh, particularly surgical procedures. Uh, there's quite a bit of research going on in that. It looks very promising. Um, with, and again, they're looking at tactile feedback, getting haptics to feedback for people using pieces of equipment. So the future, um, we're not really at Ready Player One levels anywhere near yet, and there's a lot of hype still. But um, the technology is advancing very rapidly. Um, it's still predominantly recreational. Um, and one of the biggest drawbacks at the moment has been the costs associated with high-end graphics processors to run it. It's not just the headset. You need a high-end graphics processor. Um, we do have two good quality rapid development environments now, so you can create and prototype stuff pretty quick with Unity and Unreal. They're both uh, you know, really good for producing stuff quite quickly. And of course, the hardware's getting better very, very quickly. We, we just got one of the HTC Vive Pros, um, which has got excellent resolution. It really, really is very, very good. But again, it needs a huge graphics card to run it fast, um, properly. Tetherless VR, there's a lot of hype about that, and people arguing, you know, uh, pr sorry, promoting that they're going to have headsets that are wireless within a year or so. But that's a lot of data to shift, so it's going to be interesting to see how, how that plays out and how long it is before we get quality VR, um, high-resolution VR with a wireless system. Um, but there's obviously a lot of potential, and we're just, I think we're at the very early embryonic stages of a lot of this research, so it's quite an exciting time to be involved in it. Okay, any questions?